Thank you. Thank you very much. So, first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's been an amazing conference so far. I hope to not completely drop the ball, uh, but I will prophylactically uh, apologize a little bit. The talk might end up being a mess, a bit of a mess, because I decided to change things around and uh, I have not tested it if it works out. Uh, so if you get lost, uh, it's not because the matter is difficult, it's because I didn't explain it well. And please do stop me. Every single person here should not have problems understanding what I'm talking about. It's somewhat sadly pretty elementary stuff that I'll be saying. But I hope the conclusions might be interesting. So maybe that's why it's worthwhile to talk about it. So I'm going to talk about exponential separation between classical and quantum learners. <clears throat> and I have a bunch of motivations um, that I'm going to start off with. So first of all, I don't think it's super controversial to say that uh, we don't really know that quantum computers are really good for many things, right? Uh, as much as optimistic as we can, might be. We know they're good for some number theoretic things, and we know they're good for quantum simulation and derivatives thereof, right? And very few other things. Um, and then you move on to quantum machine learning, and you ask yourself, what is that thing good for? And in my mind, there had been for a long time this, this folklore that uh, we should be learning quantum systems, right? And then I'll, I'll repeat this again. I don't mean quantum states. I mean data which come from measurements of genuinely quantum systems. Like that, that's what I always felt uh, to be true. Um, and somehow the question would then be, you know, paraphrasing Feynman, do we need quantum learners to learn quantum properties? And ask here, would Feynman agree? I, I don't have a Ouija board. I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, but I know some other people would agree, like Maria seems to, who is in the little <laughs> community outside. Uh, she seems to agree. I'll mention another person here in the introduction. Um, but I want to emphasize that I'm not talking about quantum data in the sense of quantum states. It's measured out. Everything is measured out, no transduction, just the simplest scenarios where somebody comes with measurements. Um, and then I want to now raise Ryan for a second here. He kind of hinted that his intuition is similar as well, because he wanted to study whether quantum circuits can learn other quantum circuits. That's quantum data in my sense. It produces some bit strings you measure out, and, and his result was a little bit negative. Like maybe, maybe quantum circuits cannot learn quantum circuits. And in fact, all proven advantages in, in quantum machine learning of the type that I'm talking about involve cryptography, right? It's Shor's factoring or something along these lines. Even though, arguably, simulation is more natural and better for quantum computers. We have better separation in the sense we have exponential separation as far as we know. Whereas for factoring, it's just super polynomial, right? Um, so this is what I want, want to understand. I want to go into the weeds of this thing here. Why is this the case and, and is it actually true? And uh, I, will, I will adhere to a particular uh, belief. I will believe that this diagram here is true as written, right? Uh, just for Amira, okay, I will not insist on this part. I don't necessarily care about P versus BPP, but we'll, we'll insist that BQP strictly contains these things and doesn't contain NP, the QMA contains all of it, and so on. And I will assume specifically that some problems, like factoring a discrete log, uh, are not in P or BPP, and this discrete cube root is somehow closer, closer to BPP. I'll explain why that is at some point. So these are going to be... Uh, things that I will believe in. And my question will essentially be, uh, when, when do facts of such separations in complexity theory actually say something about learning separations? Um, and what, what else do, might I need to get to learning separations? Uh, so let's talk about this for a second. Um, what do I mean by learning separations? Like, is there a, a learning problem that I can learn with a quantum machine learner but cannot with a classical one? What do I mean by learning problem? Well, let's do the kind of thing that maybe Maria could have done, but they did a little bit more. I give you, you know, the molecular configuration, and you give me the energy, right? That's the problem. It's a hard problem, but suppose that I give you a lot of data for other many, many molecules, like, a, I don't know, you might be more ambitious, you might want, want to predict superconductivity properties, high TC. So we have a database of, I don't know, 10,000 uh, materials that we've studied, right? And you use that. Uh, so can we prove that quantum computers are necessary to be able to solve such problems even in the presence of data. Um, so I'm going to be, of course, proving things eventually. So I need to be a little bit more formal, and I'll, I'll uh, work within the pack learning formalism, uh, the vanilla version, the simplest one there is, and I will agree with every criticism of that that you have. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a nice starting point. So we're learning concepts from a concept class. And for me, a concept is just, a, for now, a binary valued function over bit strings. 
Um, and what the learning algorithm does, it gets a, a bunch of data labeled by some concept from my, my concept class, and then blah, 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 turns, turns, and turns, and blah, spits out uh, what something which we're going to call a hypothesis, and that thing is supposed to do the right labeling, right? And the data points come from a fixed distribution D. So it is a fixed distribution setting. And then, uh, you know, we will talk about pack learning. Uh, if, you know, the, what, the, what is output by the algorithm is close to the correct thing relative to the distribution which is fixed within some error parameters with high probability with small error. And it's polynomial in the, in the terms. And the original pack definition has no complexity theory in it. It's just sample complexity. Uh, sorry, no computational complexity. It's just sample complexity, right? So I, I think this is like the 78th time you're hearing this this week. <laughs> yes? When you say fixed, it means it's also known to the algorithm? Uh, no, it's not known to the algorithm. Okay, so just the standard. Yeah, it's going to become apparent what I mean. But it's, it's, it's not worst case scenario. That's not what I'm considering. Like pack learning usually says for every distribution this works. I'm not saying this is pack learning for this distribution. Okay? And, and the criticism of pack learning? Do you go to this? Um, I'm just mostly then when you talk to experimentalists and what they really want to learn, you break your back trying to fit it into pack. It's something else. Right, uh, but I, I might say something more about it depending on time. So let's put complexity theory in it. So now I want to talk about efficient pack, which means that I have polynomial resources which include time, or gate complexity, or the runtime of the algorithm which does the learning. Right, and you might feel that this is already quite precise and you know pernickety, but I'm gonna get a little bit worse because it actually matters uh, eventually. So uh, learning separations advantages uh, they exist. If there exists a concept class, which a quantum computer can learn efficiently, and a classical computer cannot learn efficiently relative to the previous definition. Right? In parentheses, for some distribution, that's what, what I'm after. Um, so the first question I want to raise, if I already said that I believe in these things, like this is exactly what the world is like, why is this not a trivial question? Why don't we all immediately, yeah, well, duh, of course it's true, because I take a concept which is something like this, you know, there's, there's some quantum state which depends on some input, which is a bit string, and I do a time evolution which depends on the particular choice of the concept that I don't know and I'm trying to learn, and then you measure some expectation value and maybe you turn it into binary putting a sign on top of it or something like this. And I'm telling you, this thing here is not in BPP. I'm telling you. Why can I not immediately conclude a learning separation, right? Um, yeah, well, b because there, there is a, like at least three distinctions between standard complexity theory and learning uh, problems that I want to discuss a little bit. And the, for me, personally, the most interesting one is this data gap that you're provided data. You're provided examples of what the function you're trying to learn, uh, what, it, what it does, and this can sometimes completely uh, change the game. The second thing is, you know, it's sort of the, the inverse. Um, what's the main villain in Superman? Uh, Lex Luthor, thank you. So. Uh, it's not enough that everybody else fails, I also have to succeed, right? <laughs> so there has to be a quantum learner. There has to be a quantum learner which does it, and that's, as Ryan painfully discussed, is not necessarily always possible. Um, and finally, what I really mean by cannot compute, typically in complexity theory we talk about worst case complexity, here we have heuristics, and these pack con constraints, well, one has to be careful. Just to, just to be clear, yeah. so, so the data gap, you're just saying you have, you have a very weak constrained access to the, to the data, right? I mean, that's in contrast to the... They're the given system. according to the distribution. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So I, right. will, I, will, I will carefully avoid talking about oracles because some communities get very confused. I will talk about having a data set which is generated by the oracle of a certain size, yeah? yeah. Thank you. So let's talk about this data gap a second. I, I think most of you know these examples. Uh, but if I don't tell them, then I might have too much time. But if I do tell them I'd run, I'm not sure. So I'm going to just simply say it. As I said, it's going to be a little bit messy. So let's talk about data gap for a nice case. So let's think about the following function family that I want to learn. And it's a simple one because there's only one function per size. Right? When we talk about pack learning, there's an, there's an inherent notion of scaling. Right? It's a scaling statement. So there's one of these things where these gates are somehow chosen randomly or according to some predetermined algorithm, which is complicated enough, but polynomial time. And there's only one parameterized rotation there that is free. So there's only one parameter, and maybe I think of it as a binary described thing, and I want to output an expectation value. So even though this is one circuit per size, and even though there's only one theta that I don't know, we still don't have an efficient classical algorithm which is going to compute this thing for you. Does anybody disagree? 
Okay, good. Because it's true, we don't have an efficient algorithm which does this. However, as all of you know, or at least most of you know, since it's only one parameter and think of this as a polyrotation, I know that whatever this function is, it's of this form, right? So the only thing I don't know about it is three numbers. So you gave me three data points, and from these three data points, I find out what alpha, beta, and gamma is, and I can solve them. Now I can compute this for all thetas, right? So data completely changes how hard the problem is, and I'm going to be using interchangeably a couple of uh, um, terms here. I, I like to think about that this function looks very messed up if I write it up as, you know, expectation value of zero, blah, blah, blah. But this is just an obfusc obfuscated description of a very simple function. This is the function that I want to compute, right? I just describe it to you in a very convoluted sort of way. So this is called obfuscation. And it's also related to trapdoor function in the sense that if you, if you know some additional information, then you can compute it. But if you don't, then you can't, right? And this is very something very common in cryptography. So the, the concern that I might have is when I'm proving, you know, a learning separation, that how do I know that something like this cannot happen uh, with my learning problem, that I cannot break it using some additional information? And in fact, I really should be worried. Uh, somewhere deep down inside, I have a mission. I want to do quantum machine learning for quantum data, and then and then. Robert comes and messes up my plans because he shows he can learn ground states, he can learn whatever the heck you want to learn with classical machine learning with provable guarantees. So I get really, really worried. So how can he do that? And I'll comment on this uh, later on. So since you can learn amazing things, how do I actually prove that there's a quantum advantage? So data changes the game and it empowers classical learning a lot. And uh, in one of the earlier papers, they defined the class BPP slash SAMP which is essentially everything you compute given sampling examples of the function you're trying to compute. So additionally, I'll tell you this. It's pretty close to what we would want for learning, right? It's not identical, but close enough for me. So somehow, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger thing, and, and we don't really know what the relationship with the BQP is, or, or maybe we do. Um, but we do have some heroic examples, right, where we can prove separations. So let's talk about those very quickly. Uh, so here's the one. So on the left-hand side, this, my data is integers, integers from one to some very large prime number. Uh, is it, I think it's prime, yeah. And imagine putting them on a circle, like you know, mod, mod, P, mod P, if P is the, the large number, and I split the circle in half by a line. It's, it's fully specified by choosing one of the points, right? And I call everything to the left of it plus one and everything to the right of it minus one. Now this is a concept. I have as many concepts as there are points, right? So if P is, you know, measured in the number of bits, it's an exponentially large concept. And this is, in fact, an easy-to-learn function, an easy-to-learn concept class. You just do the most naive thing, and that's the, you can prove that it generalizes well, right? But now I do module, module exponentiation to each point, and this is, you know, close to pseudo-random functions, and it scatters the points around the circle, right? And now if I look at the mapped image, it looks like a mess, right? Every point looks complete. It's no, no, no longer linearly separable. It, it's completely messy. And this is the concept I want to study. And now you will immediately know that, well, learning this thing is easy if I can just map back. This is a bijection. If I map it back, I told you this is easy. So if I map, map it back, this, this thing here is easy. And you can do it provided you can compute the so-called discrete logarithm uh, of an integer, right? Which is the inverse of this function here. And you can do it with the second part of Shor's paper, which with essentially Shor's algorithm. Um, and this shows that a quantum learner could solve this. And the intuition is, of course, a classical learner will not solve it because we cannot do discrete log. But I didn't prove that, right? I only proved that, that if there is a classical learner that does it, it doesn't do it by applying the discrete log. It must do something else. But in this case, you can prove that, in fact, essentially, this is all you can do. So if you can learn this type of a thing, uh, then uh, in polynomial time, then you can solve the discrete logarithm. And I'll show you how the proof goes, because it involves one very important step. So let's say that I want to compute this log of a of x. That's the thing that we believe we cannot do. So I'm, I'm building towards a contradiction. The one thing that I can do now, I don't have data, right? It's a learning problem, but I don't have data. But I can make it. Why? I certainly cannot take uniformly random x and compute log. But I can take a uniform random y and cube the, cube, compute the inverse of log. That's easy. If this thing here is, uh, no, these are all integers, right? Bit strings, it's not a binary label. I'll turn it into a binary label later. If this is uniform and random, then so is this, because it's a push forward distribution over the uniform, and, and it's a bijective function. 
So I can fake data. I can make it efficiently classically. And already conceptually, this kind of tells you data doesn't help because I can make it. It cannot help. And this is just you know, going through the motions to, to use it. So OK, so this thing gives me, you know, if I learn it what, it, what did I actually end up with? I ended up with a function which doesn't really compute this. It gives me one bit of this. And it's correct sometimes because I have the pack condition, not the worst case condition, right? But then you go back some 20, 30 years, and you realize that that's enough, right? Because the discrete logarithm problem has many nice properties, uh, including that computing any single bit is as hard as computing the entire thing because of you know, group theoretic properties it has. And moreover, if you get it right on just a small fraction, like anything larger than 1 half up to polynomial gap, you can get it right everywhere. And you combine these two results, it says, well, you know, if you get it down to these heuristic things, it's still good enough to actually compute it exactly without error, uh, and so on. Um, so yeah. Your quantum learner on the previous slide just ignores the data and runs short, right? Um, well, I mean, if, if I don't know which concept it is, right, there may be many, I still have to learn which concept it is. But this is very important, what you're saying, for another reason. I'll get to it next time. Anyway, um, so, so, so this is how we resolve the problems, right? There was a data gap, but I can generate it, so there's no data gap. That's not the key. That's not the key uh, why something is classically hard uh, and quantum lazy. Quantum learnability, I have sure, great. Worst case versus heuristics, well, discrete logarithm already gives you all of these guarantees, right? So it's, it's really a fantastic problem. It, 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 it ticks off all of these boxes, right? Actually, um doesn't only really need sure, right? I thought the beauty of this paper you're describing there, I always thought is that you can prove for the problem there's a margin. So OK, so there's two papers. The first paper that I'm talking about is actually from year 2003, where the first type separations is type. You're talking about uh, the paper of Srinivasan and the guys. So they're constructing a kernel method for this, and they have to go through another way, right? But there is sure actually in the preparation of the quantum feature map that they do implicitly. You can show that the blah, blah. Uh, it's under the hood, OK? But it is under the hood. You cannot get away without it. <clears throat> so uh, um, apologies if it's not correct and I'm missing something. But as far as I know, every single learning separation uses this type of a technique to get rid of the data gap. You prove that you can generate the data. Hence, data is not a problem. And then you have to worry a little bit about these other things. Uh, so that's fantastic, right? We have so many proofs of separation. Uh, and yet, I'm not, not a happy bunny. I'm a very sad bunny. So let's talk about why I'm a happy, uh, sad bunny. Because of two reasons. First, that I could argue that this doesn't necessarily bring about learning separations in the sense in which I would consider something learning. And the second one, what about my physics? I want my physics. In my physics, I cannot generate the data efficiently, classically. I don't know how to do that. So I'm still kind of stuck. So we're going to do these two things and something in the middle. Um, but I might need to hurry up a little bit. So there's a, there's a little subtlety. Uh, there's a little subtlety in our proof that I described that I kind of said, which, which I didn't specify in the definition of packed learning. The kind of proof goes that if I could learn the concept, then I could evaluate the discrete log because I can get the label out, right? Which means that I'm implicitly deciding that can learn means that I can evaluate the concept on a new point. I didn't emphasize this before, but this is really what I need for the proof to go through. But it's not the only possibility. What if my job was just to decide which concept it is without the power to evaluate it? That's a, I'll, I'll say why I care about these types of things. Because if it's just about not possible to evaluate, but that's a complexity theory statement. It's not a learning statement, right? And I'll make it explicit why it's not. So why do I care about uh, this, this uh, you know, learn rather than evaluate case. Because for instance, if we talk about learning order parameters, maybe I care about that. I mean, I'm not going to be preparing ground states. Like, that's hard. But I can still learn order parameters. Um, Hamiltonian learning also, I don't need to prepare these Gibbs states or anything else to learn them, right? They, they come from the lab or, I don't know, in particle physics from the universe, which had, I don't know, 14 billion years to find its ground state or whatever. I just need to learn these parameters. So it's, it's, it has important applications. And second, Evaluate is a little bit unsatisfactory from the notion of what I personally consider learning is about. So let me explain this thing first. But to do that, I'm going to have to be even more 
Fidgety and pernickety and apologies. Yes. Sorry, just to make sure I understand this. So you're saying you want to consider learning algorithms that output descriptions of a concept that do not necessarily allow you to evaluate the concept. I'll make it precise right now. Yes, but I'll make it precise right now. Okay. So I need to think about what 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 are the sort of the main players in in the tragic comedy. Uh, one player is the concept class, right? So these are the thing. This is the ground truth, the thing that labels the data. Another thing is the machine learning algorithm, which does. Do -do 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 and then something happens, and then it spits out a labeling function, right? If you think about neural networks, there's no spitting out of labeling function, but what we really did is we found the weights, but then this particular neural network is that thing, right? That's implicit there. So I need to worry about what kinds of machines generate the ground truth, what machine finds a solution, which machine runs the solution, right? These are the three components that, that I need to somehow delineate. Um, and this gives you a forest of things. Right? So first, we're going to have three things as a possible concept that I'll discuss, like functions that I can evaluate in a classic computer, obfuscated functions, you've seen an example, uh, you'll see another one later, and then functions that need a quantum computer. Uh, machine learning algorithm can be either classical or quantum. Hypothesis class can be classical or quantum, to be made precise in a second. And I might think about various types of separations. Like, can I separate CC learners from CQ learners, like where this is classical, but this can still be quantum? This is going to be the identification problem. Because I don't need to be able to evaluate it classically, but I'll tell you which circuit would do the job, right? This thing here um, is, well, this thing here actually is the question. OK, we'll, we'll get to this in a second. So some of these things make sense. Um, what we had before, if everything, you know, if this is a, any of these things, and the machine learning algorithm is classical, and I have to output a classical description of the function that does the job, um, this is the task we're evaluating, right? Because if I can evaluate and I'm classical, then there's a polynomial size circuit which does it, right? That's, that's what I mean by evaluate now, okay? So the hypothesis class and the learning algorithm are runnable on a classical machine in polynomial time. Uh, if I make the hypothesis class say quantum, then I might be talking about something else, right? Now, now I cannot evaluate it, but I can find which algorithm would do it. And it seems like they identify the concept thing, but then if you think about it a little bit longer than five minutes uh, and read books of much smarter people, then you find out that there's actually a problem. Because if we call quantum here to mean all polynomial size quantum circuits, then you can somehow delegate the learning problem onto the concept class itself, somehow prefix it. And it ends up being that the CQ is actually the same as QQ. So it doesn't even, my question doesn't even make sense. But it does if, it's, if I restrict what quantum circuits I'm allowed to use. Like, for instance, in, a, in the example of order parameters, let's say we want to learn local order parameters without a blow up of the system. Then I cannot pull this trick, right? Then it's a legitimate question. If I don't put any restrictions, then it's kind of blurring the boundary between classical and quantum. So, yeah? I didn't understand this argument why CQ is equal to QQ. Can you repeat uh, it? I don't want to well, because I, I mean, this thing is some quantum computation, and I can, I can put inside the entire data set and say, well, whatever the quantum computer would do, do it on the data set, and then whatever it would spit out, well, that's the circuit, right? So each time you're asked to evaluate, you just run the whole learning thing yeah. from storage. It's still polynomial size circuit, right? It's polynomial size is very forgiving for these things, right? Yeah. Um, when you now say that the evaluating machine is quantum, is it still evaluating from a classical description? There's no quantum states in my life. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I've never seen a quantum state. I don't know how to say that. No, no, no. It's, it's classical bit strings. Yeah. Okay. So another annoying question. So Not annoying. If, you, if you do this, then um, you in particular avoid classical crypto problems, right? Because they're like to get classical learning hardness from. We'll, crypto we'll get to it. We'll classical. get to it. There's, I have another uh, 170 slides to go in okay. five minutes, so it's going to be a movie. <laughs> 30 frames a second. Anyway. Um, so let's think about the discrete log example. There, the concept class was something which I need a quantum computer for by my belief, by my faith, right, that we said, said. And I asked whether I can do the classical learning algorithm, which outputs a classical thing because I wanted to label, right? So there has to be a circuit. So this was the, the challenge, the thing that I'm going to say it's not possible. Um, and if you agree with me that I cannot evaluate the DLP thing here, sorry, here, but it lives here. Um, I get a trivial separation between the CC case, which is this one, and the QQ case where I allow both the learner and the hypothesis class to be quantum. 
What do we mean by trivial separation? I'm going back to a comment in a second ago. It also persists if I have only one concept per size. So the learner knows the concept. It knows the labeling function. It's this one. There's only one. It still cannot evaluate. The quantum learner doesn't need data because there's only one concept. It can evaluate it. So I have a provable learning separation according to my definition of learning separations where I don't need data and uh, how, how is this learning again? Right? It, it, it feels, I'm not super happy with it, but, but in the end I'll come back to it a little bit later because I will have no other choice but to work with this definition. But do, do, do you understand here sort of, I can trivialize the problem. I said, that's what I want to say. There is a world in which it's extremely trivial to prove separations, but you're not going to be happy. And I'm not happy either, and I'm just telling you. Um, so yeah, so don't need data, so I'm not happy. So can we make it a little bit less quantum? Can we make it more about learning? And yeah. About your previous point, I could make the same point in a purely classical world, right? If I look at stuff that can be classically evaluated, but then I artificially restrict my learner to something yeah. that cannot evaluate it, then you would yeah. have the same argument. Yeah, 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 indeed. So now, now we're going to the place where we actually, Casper, Casper and I, mostly Casper, thought spend some brain power. Kind of, kind of get it to be less quant, you know, to work with the less quantum concept and to make it more about learning. It turns out these two things go hand in hand. Um, so uh, here's an example of a CCQC separation. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, in both cases, the hypothesis class is not going to be classical. So there is a there is a way of labeling the function with a classical circuit. You're just not going to be able to figure it out with a classical algorithm, right? So this brings us a little bit closer. And the concept class is the so-called cube root co concept class. So this is a modular power three. Take the inverse of that. That's the problem. It is related to the RSA function. It is a special case. And my concept is, uh, I don't know, the i-th bit of, of that thing, let's say. Now the catch is that this function here has a trapdoor. I know that there exists a d star, which depends on n alone such that the inverse is equal to just modular exponentiation with the exponent d star. And there's reasons to believe, because I believe people who are smart, uh, that we don't know how to find this d star classically. Right? It's, hard, it's hard to solve this uh, cube root problem. Moreover, it's been proven that it has all those nice properties. That every bit is hard. And if you, if you learn it, if you can compute in 1 half plus 1 over poly fraction of the inputs, you can compute it everywhere. It has all these nice properties. Um, so quantumly, uh, I can find this star. Again, sure, sure allows me to do that. Classically, uh, I cannot. So in this case, um, you can again prove that if, if there was a classical learner that could learn it, it could solve the problem. The hypothesis class is fully classical. Everything looks fine. Uh, the concept class is now classically obfuscated because I give you this description. I don't give you this description, and that's important. If I give you this description, then I don't have my example anymore. Then the classical learner would be able to do it as well. So this is kind of better. Um, we're not still super happy with it, because in the end here also we can in fact drop this i. It will not matter, and you don't need data to learn. So it's not it. It's getting there, not it. Um, so we do something else. We, do, we have a completely new class, which we call the modular exponentiation class which is sort of a set of these cube root problems, but not the cube root, but dth root, okay, essentially. Some, something like that. Um, and in this case, the concept class is classically evaluatable. It is not obfuscated. Every one of these things are easy to compute. Uh, classical, the machine learning algorithm in hypothesis class, if they're classical, you cannot learn it because one particular concept is in here is the cube root problem. So you could prove that you could learn it, you could solve the cube root, so that's not gonna work. Uh, quantumly, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of work, uh, a little bit of work, you, you, you need a bunch of data points, then you do order finding in parallel to computing discrete log on, on the data and the label. You get a system of congruence equations and then you have enough of them, you prove you're gonna get enough of them, you solve the system and, and, and it actually works out. So this is pretty much what we want. It's classical concepts, you need data and so on and so on. What I didn't emphasize is that the concepts are not binary anymore. They're, they, 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 they're bit strings. We're kind of trying to get rid of this and have only one bit as an output, but it's, we're kind of stuck there. We think it's true. You can get away with just one bit, but we didn't prove it. Right? So 
this is excellent, except that I don't, I, I don't have bit strings. And we have another mo one problem, which is called discrete cube root identification problem, which is an example of this restricted uh, concept class where um, it's a CQ separation, but the quantum concepts are restricted. Uh, I, I'm not allowing all polynomial circuits. And then you can have a separation. OK, so it's proper pack. It ends up being proper pack. I just give you the, the particular functions that define the labeling. Yeah. So how, how, until when do I have? When do we start? I have 20 more minutes, right? OK. Good. So uh, and now I would like to move to the physics focal question, because I didn't solve the problem that everywhere, everything I was saying has uh, generatable data, right? So it's not what I want. But it is hopefully emphasizing that, that what it means to learn and how, what kinds of separations you get. It's a subtle thing. There's not one separation. There's many different separations. Um, you can build them. And for me, it was very surprising to know that there are separations where everything is classically doable, except figuring out which concept it is. Right? That, that's for me. Yeah. The problem you have with the data being general, generatable is that you suspect maybe all the cases where we can prove these things are not the cases that we care about. Problems or uh, let me be precise in the statement. Just, yeah. All of the proof techniques fail unless they have generatable data. Exactly. And you suspect that it might actually be a, um, a property of um, you know, being able to show these separations. Because it could also just be that accidentally the proofs we found have this property, but this property is... No, no, no. It's fundamental to the okay. proof. It's fundamental to the, this is how you get rid of the data. You cannot get rid of it, right? Oh, no, no, I think there is. That's the second part of the talk. I think, I think there is. That's, there's a happy end. This is a happy talk. Quantum computers work. They make sense. I forgot to say. Uh, right? It's like, we. It's a happy talk, right? But, it, but we have to get there. Uh, but before we do, let, let me just do a small intermezzo, which is an application of this uh, to another problem, which is related. It ends up understanding this learning actually has some implications a little bit. So uh, number one, the large, the shadows of quantum machine learning. This is a paper we did, which uh, I, I, I kind of like. And, uh, and it's, you know, when will I able to put a quantum computer in my smartwatch? That's my question. How, how long do I have to wait? Can I, can I hear a number? 10 years? It's usually 10 years for whatever we want to do with quantum computers, right? So maybe it's more than 10 years for this particular case. Uh, so let's, uh, let's have a more reasonable question. Can have advantages for quantum machine learning where the training is quantum, but the use of the learned thing is classical, right? So the, we call it deployment. Like the training, you need a quantum computer, and you probably need it, but then you deploy it fully classically. And it's closely related to the works of, of Jens and many of you here in the audience about uh, classical surrogates. We, we had kind of results that I'm going to show you for, I think, two years now. Uh, like everybody was faster than we were in, in, in doing these results, but luckily it's not a full scoop, so I can say something that you may have not heard about. So this is my question, right? Can I, can I, can I have provable learning separations in the case where just the training is quantum, uh, but deployment is classical? Um, and, and to tell you how this works, let me just remind you that there's sort of like three main models uh, which are not independent. There's the explicit model, which you know, uses data just in the beginning to prepare some feature state, and then the observable is parameterized, and that's it. And these are linear models, linear in the feature space. Yeah? Then you have uh, implicit models or kernels, which are simply using the kernel tree building on this. And there's data reporting models, which are manifestly not linear, right? because I have uh, this interspreading of, of uh, data and free parameters, and it doesn't look like an inner product of this type. Like it's not a linear model. Sorry, I mean, it's important there to clarify that. <coughs> Like, it's not linear in the Hilbert space, but it's definitely linear in some, like, other... That's what we're going to prove. Yeah. That's going to be a, a lemma, if you wish. Sure. But as you pointed out, it's linear somewhere. I'll make it explicit where it's linear as well in a, in a second. It's, it's not a very important thing, and I just want to uh, put you in the right mindset. So maybe let's stick, skip this result. Maybe it's not super relevant. Uh, but indeed, I can always map a data reuploading problem completely faithfully to an explicit model in such a way that I get exactly the same concept... Uh, function family. And the way we did it, here's a simple example, is simply using basic teleportation or measure-based quantum computing, whichever one you wish, that I simply um, you know, move all the data to the very beginning and then use gate teleportation interspreadedly. Right? And the price that I have to pay is that now I have to have projections here which are of low rank, rank one for each qubit. 
This is going to decrease my margin, but in terms of function, family is the same thing. Right? So they're identical, and this is now an explicit model where I have you know, data first and then observable second. Okay? And this is not, I mean, you can prove learning separations within the models. They're not the same, but right now I care about this. And now I'm going to do something different. I'm going to talk about something which is called the flip model, which is you take the explicit model and then you flip it around. Okay? Re recall, I'm going to go towards quantum machine learning and training only. This is an intermediary step. So what's the flip model? I make the states depend on the training parameters, and the input influence my observable. Just flip it around, okay? Um, the reason why I want to think about this is, well, we were interested because not many looked at this. As far as, no, there's no paper that explicitly looks at this. Uh, but the point is now the quantum state doesn't depend on data anymore. There's only one quantum state. I found it in the training, and there's one quantum state. The measurement that I do on it later depends on the data, but not the state. So now I can think, well, maybe I sh sh do shadow tomography here, right? Classical shadows, in fact, not shadow tomography. Take the classical data and then do my expectation value later on, right? That's, that's, that's why we call it shadow models, because I want to do something like that. Um, and just to point out, you could get flipped models directly by simply using the same construction but teleporting not the data but teleporting the training angles and moving the side. So I could have gotten the model by this construction as well. It's completely symmetric. So we studied this flipped model a little bit. I will not go into this too much. We studied like what's the cost of translating from explicit models to flipped models by uh, you know, adding one qubit to get rid of the negative eigenvalues in the observable to make it a quantum state and taking the quantum state as the observable ends up um, well, there's some bounds you can find, and it's a very connected to the quantum state learning of Aronson from 2003. Yes? Can, can one found in all these instances of the overhead that one needs to go from one picture to the other? Yeah. Yeah, for, for, the, for the general case. That's yeah. the work with Sophia, right? Yes. 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 It's, it's, it's quite bad. There's a, there's a huge price to pay, even though for any particular realization which doesn't have an exponentially deep circuit, this construction is actually much more efficient. But that's uh, beside my, my main point. Uh, okay, I just want to say you can say stuff about this. It's not a crazy model. Um, but it leads us to think about what we're going to call shadow models. So what's a shadow model? It's, man, it's meant to capture everything you can conceive in the setting where I'm allowed to do whatever I want in the training phase, but then the deployment has to be classical, right? So you do whatever you want in the training phase with your training data set, as many circuits as you wish you run, well, polynomially many. You get some bit strings out, as many as you wish, as long as it's polynomially bounded. And then later, I have a, learning, I have a deployment algorithm which just takes these bit strings from the training phase, a new point, and computes the label. So this I call shadow models, right? Because this is sort of a shadowing phase and then a deployment phase. And this is classical, this is quantum. I don't think there's anything missing in this picture. You cannot put more stuff. We didn't limit anything. This is everything there is, OK? I'm going to say the model is shadowifiable if there exists a shadow model which is effectively the same thing, okay? Which I, which I can approximate by shadow model. And now the first result is that flipped models are shadow universal, meaning every shadow model corresponds to a flipped model. They capture everything there is. And here's the proof, right? This was the shadowing phase. I just make everything coherent. And this is a flipped model. It has things which depend just on, on the thetas here and just data here, okay? It's a very simple proof. The next two th results are a little bit more interesting. First one, you can have quantum learning advantages with shadowifiable models. And second one, no shadowifiable models are not enough. There's things which are not shadowifiable, but quantum machine learning can do it. And essentially, I mean, th this is sort of a diagram. Um, discrete cube root is here in the things which you can do with shadow models. Uh, discrete logarithm problem we cannot do in shadow models. Um, and classical models are here. Um, so for, for theorem three, uh, quantum learning advantage, essentially the idea is in the learning phase you crack your cube root. You find out what your D is and then you'll use it later. End of story. Um, so for the second theorem that uh, the shadow models are not everything there is, know that shadow models are in class which we call BPP slash QGen poly, which is a classical algorithms with advice generated by quantum computer in polynomial time. It's a new invention. We're working on understanding exactly how far we can push these things in complexity theory alone. Um, but whatever this thing he here is, it's in the class P slash poly. So I will talk about this a little bit more. This is the class of problem solvable with you know, God-given advice, the best possible advice string. 
which depends only on the size of the instance, but not on the particular instance you have. It's also known as non-uniform circuits. Like, there's no Turing machine which tells me which circuit to apply, uh, but there is an optimal circuit that I can run. So uh, this thing here is obviously in here, well, obviously in p slash poly. Um, now, if we assume that BQP is not in p slash poly, ignore this error for now, it's, it's not very relevant, and we think discrete logarithm is not there. We think discrete logarithm is not in p slash poly, uh, if it's not there, then it cannot be in BPP slash QGen poly. So it means it's, it's outside. So the discrete log thing, we don't know how to shadowify. We don't think there is a way of shadowifying it because it will violate assumptions that the uh, discrete logarithm is not in P slash poly. Um, whereas discrete cube root is not classically learnable, but it is in sh shadow learnable. Yes? So what about BPP slash C gen? Q. Where's, where's C? No, I'm, I'm asking, like, why is that not on? Because they're just BPP. Okay. They're, okay. Just, they're just BPP. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so the proof of BPP and QGen poly, are BPP slash QGen poly and BPP slash poly just more or less the same as BPP and QGen poly? Or is it uh, it's, it's even simpler. I mean, because you know that this thing here is in BPP slash poly, because poly advice is strictly stronger than QGen poly advice, and BPP slash poly is P slash poly, right? I don't know. Good. Um, note, by the way, that this theorem three, that there can be a learning advantage. I, we already had it whenever we had a CCQC separation. So QC says, I, I find out which hypothesis to use quantumly, but then the hypothesis is classical. Well, that's exactly what, what learning quantumly, learning, well, quantum in the training phase only is, right? So, so I had it already for module exponentiation. It just, this is a more interesting case, the, the discrete, discrete cube root. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip this because now I'm really running out of time. So let's, let's, I'm going to switch gears again. Sorry for the whiplash. So all I wanted to say that these shadow models, which are all about what can you actually, whether, le having learning advantages where just the training is, uh, is classical and whether we can, what was the term, cook in factoring and stuff there as well. Yes, we can. And it's a direct consequence of the things which, which was the analysis of learning separations. So it's, it's direct corollary. Um, and it's interesting, I think, okay? Any comments, questions here before I switch gears? Yes, I have a question which is a little bit on your physics folklore. Yeah. I tried to find out what these physicists really want. You, you tried to find out? Yes. And how, how did that go? <laughs> I'm still here and I'm still as dumbing before. Okay, 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 I'm okay. talking to them, they're my friends now, but I don't, still don't really know okay, how can... the physical problems we should, you know, you, you're pointing this in a certain direction, mm -hmm. and, and I'm very frustrated in finding the I can, direction. To I can give you examples from high energy physics, I'll give you a bunch of examples which I don't know if the physicists care about, and I can give you some examples in condensed matter that I think Roger would know best here what physicists care about in terms of that, but maybe he's going to talk about it tomorrow. Uh, I, I can give some examples. We did some homework there. Okay, so let's go to what, what I feel is the most important thing because this is where I was happy when I understood this, so I hope you will be happy too. Um, so the problem with quantum generated data, so not quantum data, data generated by measurements of a genuine quantum system, we don't have efficient generation capacity. I cannot generate pairs for a quantum function. I don't know how to do that. We don't think we can do that. Every proof of classical lower, lower bounds required that, that we had. That's the problem, okay? Yet, I still want to claim that concepts of this type are not learnable in the sense that no classical algorithm satisfies that given data from this thing here and the new label, I can get the evaluation of the concept. So I'm going back to the evaluation definition, right? So it's not learnable, okay? It's gonna be easy to show once we identify a certain co complexity classes. It's gonna be a little bit underwhelming, but I think it's, it's important to just state it once, okay? So here's what we have. We have BQP, we have discrete logarithm, which is in the intersection of BQP and things which are random generatable. Uh, correct terminology here would be actually random verifiable functions from Marig and Salva from 2006, but for us it makes sense to call it random generatable. BPP is in here. Discrete log is in here. There's things which are not in BQP but are here like things based around the graph isomorphism problem. Then there's the problem of BPP slash SAMP. So these are the things that classical computers can do with access to data. 
I, my, my main problem is that I don't know the relationship between BQP and BVP slash SAMP. But I do. Thank you, that's it. Almost, almost. So what do I know? Enter class P slash poly, which I already mentioned. So this is the class of non-uniform circuits of, or, or things that a, a Turing machine can solve in polynomial time. Given an advice state where the advice is specific only to the size of the problem, but not the instance. It's a weird class, contains BPP by Adelman's theorem. It probably doesn't contain MP unless the polynomial hierarchy collapses. It contains uncomputable things. It contains all unary languages. Okay, so it's, it's a weird thing. But thanks to Robert, we also know that it contains BPP slash SAMP. So BPP slash SAMP was a weird beast, but this thing we understand quite well. Well, there are many papers which say that some things are not true. And this is what I want to use, right? So in particular, we think that BQP complete problems are not in P slash poly. And if we agree on that, well, if BQP complete problems don't have polynomial size circuits, up to here, this is uh, up to the fact that I needed to only work on a fraction of, of inputs, uh, then BQP complete problems are not learnable in the sense of evaluation. That's a trivial statement. There is no polynomial circuit which is gonna do the right job. What I'm leveraging here is that, well, this is true as long as I accept that P slash poly doesn't contain BQP, and we tend to accept this because discrete logarithm is in here. And we think it's not here. Crypto people deal all the time with non-uniform adversaries, and they say, no, you cannot crack discrete log, right? Lemma two, I can learn them quantumly in some cases. Now, this might be, this is the underwhelming part. I simply take a polynomially sized concept class. Then I test. I try out every single concept and I pick the one which is the best fit and with high probability that's the right outcome. Good. Um, let's, stick, let's move away from the heuristic for a second in the interest of time. So this is the actual claim. A BQP problem which are not in heuristic version of P slash poly under some distribution, there's some distribution, are not learnable classically under the same distribution. Factoring is like that, discrete log is like that. All BQP complete problems have hard to learn versions under certain distributions. Every single BQP complete problem you give, I can construct a learning separation for that problem for some distribution. Not just BQP complete, also BQP hard. Why? Because anything which is, let's say, QMA complete contains instances which are BQP complete, and then I just choose my distribution to just have uh, uh, support over that. So now, in condensed matter, Bose Hubbard uh, model time evolution, XY Hamiltonian, or anything which is from behind with respect to ground states, uh, electronic structure problem in, in, in high energy physics, topological quantum field theories via Jones polynomials, supersymmetric theories via QMA1 hardness of um, Betty number estimation, one plus one massive five four, that's Stephen Jordan and uh, uh, Preskill and somebody whom I forget, I hope it's not you, Robin. Um, and possibly Kogut-Saskin theories, all of these things satisfy this condition, right? That they're hard enough. Every single one of them has an easy to artificially construct learning problem where there's a learning separation. However, yeah. How, how explicit would that be? Like, I mean, say time evolution is like yeah. Hamiltonian. Yeah, yeah, just what? take one Hamiltonian which is, which is, com which is complete, uh, con construct a concept class which has a polynomial many of them and we're done. That thing you cannot learn classically according to evolution definition. It's trivial. It's, this is the, the, the letdown thing. It is actually easier than we thought. The price I paid that before, my, my pillar of faith was DLP. Discrete logarithm is not in P. This is what you get for the factoring type things. Here I'm saying BQP complete is not an error P slash poly. If you believe this, you can have as many learning separations as you wish. And there's good reason to believe that, okay? In physics, right? So now, uh, I mean, just, just more comments or QML, let's not measure it and how will it classify cats with dogs, right? I think everybody agrees here. Uh, it's not meant to do that. Uh, whether we're upset about complexity theory and whether it's applicable to QML, maybe not in cats with dogs things, but because, why? Because it works asymptotically, right? But if we think about, you know, condensed matter where we care about properties of Avogadro number of particles, if we care, care about high energy physics, like uh, what I like to think about is lattice gauge theories, where you want to increase the precision or you want to you know, decrease the scaling to get higher frequency, to get higher en energies, to understand, I don't know, quark-gluon plasma, uh, that thing requires scaling. 
right? So these really feel like the right problems where complexity theory guarantees actually map onto de facto separations in wall clock time, right? The, there's a wall clock. Uh, so I don't know, I'm very excited about that part, that this is the right application, this is the type of thing. We can talk more precisely which ones. Um, Connection to Huang et al. We also in the paper explain why uh, their learning algorithm only works if the gap is constant, which is an assumption. Feels like a technical assumption. Turns out, no, it's critical. If you make it less than constant, then then th their proof cannot go go through without violating complexity theory. So it kind of clicks. Every, details matter, I guess, is what I want to say. And I, I think I'm totally out of time, right? So. Maybe it's just some consequences on NISC, right? You know, if I can achieve simulation, I can achieve learning separation, full stop. Perhaps I can do it with fewer resources. This goes back to the comment that Nathan gave yesterday, that the idea of their approach is to get more condensed circuits than simulation, right? This is what machine learning is supposed to give you in general. This is why it works. It gives you the most condensed dense version of the thing you're trying to solve, more condensed than the Turing machine description of the algorithm because it uses data to find a shortcut, right? That's what we're doing. It, it works in complexity theoretic sense. It works in just finding shorter descriptions of the function we're looking for. You can do it because you have data, right? Both classically and quantumly, right? Um, and I have a bunch of questions and the many things we're not super happy with yet. So this is a kind of just a s starting right now. And I, I want to absolutely thank Casper. He did such an excellent job in the complexity theory paper. And also in the second paper that we discussed with Sofian, who is now with Jens, and Ricardo and Simon, who are uh, also PhD students in Leiden. And uh, thank you. <laughs>